What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here from Data Dash, and today is May 8th of 2023. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video, we've got to spend some time to talk about some major sell side pressure that's starting to hit crypto markets as we're seeing massive distribution or sell side pressure from whales overwhelming any potential buy side pressure we're getting, signaling that we could very well be at the beginning of a trend shift to the downside in the near term. We've got a lot of things to dive into in today's video that you guys want to know about, but one of the biggest things I want to emphasize is that it's not so much always about catching the next big move, but making sure that when you're operating in financial markets, you're operating safely, making sure that at the end of the day, your identity is safe from different types of hackers and malicious actors. And that's why I wanna spend some time today to talk about our sponsor, Aura. Aura is a 360 degree identity theft protection platform that provides a full suite of services to protect you when you browse online. Rather than needing a multitude of online subscriptions to keep your personal data and web activity safe, Aura offers up to $1 million of identity theft insurance, a web VPN, password manager, personal privacy assistant, and an email alias tool to prevent unwanted emails and data breaches. They offer all of this for the low cost of just $12 a month. Each year, over 15 million Americans experience identity theft with an average loss of $3,500 each, and one in five people in the EU have experienced identity theft in their lifetime. The cost-benefit analysis is clear. One of the greatest investments you can make in yourself is protecting your online presence, and Aura can help you get there. In order to do this, check out the link down below in the description where you can start on a free 14-day trial utilizing my link down below in the description in order to see if Aura is the right fit for you. Alrighty, everyone, so let's go ahead and kick off the Bitcoin price analysis. I wanna start here by focusing in on the daily time frame because there are a lot of giveaway signs that we are likely gonna be seeing downward price pressure over the next few days. First off, I wanna talk here about our trend momentum indicator, signaling consistent red and blue flips here, showing inconsistency in the trend versus the clear breakaway we got most of the time here throughout our trend. Right, So this is at a minimum showing that we're gonna likely have some kind of short-term correction here over the next coming days and weeks, no matter if you're of the bull market narrative or the idea that this is a massive relief rally and that we're gonna be correcting lower like we believe. But on top of that as well, when it comes to price action, we've basically been here since March 19th. We've made no acceleration in price here in almost two months well over one and a half months here in the sense of price action. So this is not playing into the thesis of this Bitcoin bank run that everyone is talking about, that there's this overwhelming amount of supposed buy side pressure driving up Bitcoin's price. And outside of that as well, one of the big things that a lot of people have not pointed out here is the line of increasing resistance in Bitcoin's price has yet again, instead of turning into support like it was looking like it might be doing here within March and April, has now been confirmed as resistance back in April with prices stalling and continuing to move lower here. So this is not a good look here from a price action perspective. But what makes matters even worse and starts to explain why price action is playing out like it is, is when we take a look at the market order flow or the cumulative volume delta. We try to analyze this here on the channel. It's something that a lot of people don't take a look at because it does give us a good idea about what's really going on in financial markets right now. Right now, over the past seven days, we have a cumulative volume delta of nearly minus 10,000 points. Now, this is taking a look at Bookmap's exclusive tool, Multibook. It allows us to take a look at the order book across some of the major exchanges, such as Binance and Huobi, getting deep liquidity and understanding where we're seeing buyers or sellers come in. And on top of that, which one is outweighing the other when it comes to the more desirable trade, getting in and out of a position quickly, or market trades or market orders, right? When we consider who's pushing price in either direction, we really wanna figure out who is controlling the market order flow. Are there more buyers, more sellers who are looking to take Bitcoin or cash at the best available price? That's the question we need to ask ourselves here. Once we figure that out, we can start to realize where a lot of the large players are getting positions in or out of the market. Right now, we've got a massive amount of cumulative volume delta to the downside, and it's just been continuing here throughout the week with little change here within market price. 
Now, this is a big important dynamic factor for us to understand here because when we take a look at the shorter term time frame when we get this consistent chop where every single time we get some kind of supplemental move to the upside of around seven to ten percent it gets dumped or offloaded here and the exchanges again are just taking upon this opportunity. A lot of this is really ironically the exchange is playing with you as a trader because they know that a lot of people are out there trading on derivatives. They know a lot of people are trading within a margin span of 10x or more. And it's a perfect range to just chop traders up, short or long, it doesn't matter. They knock out both parties, make tons of money in the process. Your deposits become their money when you play this stupid game. And unfortunately, so many people, so many good meaning people who had a lot of money saved up, who earned hard earned money, get chopped up in this. When in the long term, we're starting the long major down structure here where even those who may be, for example, two, three, five X long are gonna be at risk of getting knocked out of their positions because they FOMO'd in at the top and bought into the narrative that there's some major Bitcoin bank run. The exchanges make money in the short term on both sides of the trade and they will massively knock out those who are too positioned in the kind of price structures they've built up. You guys don't think for a moment that the exchanges don't have a hand in this? that a lot of entities who were caught empty handed over the past year, just think about for a moment here, right? How many lending platforms, exchanges, huge crypto entities, even enterprise companies, right? All these major backbone parts of infrastructure in the crypto space, how many got caught red handed here back in 2021 and 2022? You don't think some of them are trying to play with price here? those who have all the data they need on market order flow and structure, I think that they're playing this out, guys. They're slowly trying to recoup losses and cover up holes in their balance sheets. And the only way they do that is from stealing from you, depositors. It's an unfortunate reality, but that's the name of the game when it comes to finance. The exchanges, the institutions, they get liquidity, they get earnings from when you make deposits on their apps and exchanges. Right? And that's why we try to focus here on long-term investing rather than short-term trading. And on top of that, trying to buy in when there's real capitulation, not buying into FOMO, right? This does not look to me like the continuation of a bull market rally. Just take a look here, price here, guys, right? We've seen uh, the kind of relief rallies uh, or even those kind of extended rallies that play out after a bear market, right? Even though we came back here again, we can neglect, of course, some of the extremes here from the COVID uh, era here. But really, we came all the way down from 14K to 6K, right? Still, either way, that was still the beginning, I think, of a long-term bull market for Bitcoin's price. But take a look here at what happens very distinctly versus what we saw during that last relief rally. If anything, we had maybe three weeks of sideways price action, then we went higher. One red week here of 12%, then we accelerated higher and had multiple weeks of green. Look what price is doing now. Looks relatively choppy, inconsistent. Certainly not a Bitcoin bank run as everyone is selling us. So if there's not some major run to Bitcoin during this time where people are switching to different banks, chasing better yields, losing a bit of trust in the financial system, right? During this prime time for Bitcoin to potentially be that asset, and we're not seeing it in the price, what is the narrative going to be? What is going to drive Bitcoin's price higher? I've heard some people point towards the balance sheet of, of China expanding. Uh, I've heard all kinds of kind of like small narratives that people are, you know, kind of just reaching for straws. I don't mean to be mean, right, guys? I mean, at the, at, I know at the end of the day, we've been talking about markets moving lower here. Uh, we haven't been trying to short the markets just yet, right? So big difference there. The big thing here, though, is that just really, just try to be realistic here. What is our narrative? Last cycle, we had tons to be optimistic about. We had a resurgence in DeFi as a category, new entire asset class and application suite within the crypto space. We were really early to DeFi. We were stacking Ethereum at around $100, $200 per coin, right? We we're real excited about Ethereum. And we were also excited in tokens like Uni, which were the native governance protocol token for Uniswap. We bought it when no one was buying it during November and October of 2020. And we rode the wave of that altcoin cycle. Trust me, we are all about chasing those narratives, making good gains, making solid trades. But to be honest with you guys, 
what's the narrative here? It's not NFTs. NFTs are dead, right? NFTs are done. That did not hold up. GameFi, done. Kaputs. What is going to be the narrative here? I just can't think of anything, guys. I really, I want to be as realistic with you guys as possible. We have covered crypto here on this channel for more than five years. It's coming up on almost six years here in about two months. Crazy. It's been a huge part of my life here now that I think about it. But, um, you know, I've traded in traditional financial markets before that as well. I just got to tell you guys, what's the narrative? What is, what is going to be the thing that really drives this to new all-time highs? certainly not going to be a Bitcoin bank run, at least not of, according to the current price action we're seeing. And it's not going to be some technological move because there's little development going on in the crypto space. Little new narratives that are coming out there that could actually sustain a long-term uptrend during a contractionary period. And not to mention during a period of time, there's a lot of de-risking in the financial space. Don't believe me? Let's take a look at the titan of investing, Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett is usually buying when there's blood in the streets. He's usually buying early on during the start of a new cycle, right? Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway as a whole, his company is sitting on a massive pile of cash, one of the biggest piles it's ever had before. And you would think that they're going out on a buying spree. Oh, over the last quarter, Berkshire Hathaway sold billions in stock, six billion alone on stocks like Chevron, right? Now we're gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about the kind of nuances here because there are important telltale signs about selling oil stocks and banking stocks like Warren and the rest of Berkshire Hathaway did. So they cashed out about 20% of their stake, 35 million shares in Chevron, but they also started to sell some shares in Taiwan Semiconductors. So again, starting to get bearish on the semiconductor market as well as two major US banks. Now, if we take a look at the core data here, we can just kind of scroll through and see recent activity here for some of the names untouched on their position on Apple as Apple's continued to lead the market. They reduced some of their position at Chevron, technology names like Activision and Blizzard into the recent strength. And they've been selling some major positions here within the banking industry. 59% of their holdings in Bank of New York Mellon Corp, another regional bank within the financial system. And on top of that, if we take a look down here, massive sell side pressure on Taiwan Semiconductor, TSM. This is the backbone of the semiconductor sector. Again, uh, we've been generally kind of bearish on these technology names. We think the AI narrative is overhyped, that larger investors like Warren Buffett are getting the picture. They're taking advantage of this relief rally that's driven by retail speculation, retail traders coming in, thinking that it's a new bull market. If you need any proof of that, take a look at this reduction, 86% and Taiwan semiconductors, right? And on last but not least as well, we gotta take a look at the reduction in US Bank Corp. Now, bear in mind, in the grand scheme of things, these are small plays within Berkshire's portfolio. But the fact that Warren is willing to reduce the position size of these companies by such a high degree shows that he doesn't feel the, the risk of holding these companies is worth any potential reward. To see these kind of reductions out of all the other names that he has here within his portfolio is baffling, especially when you consider how far they have already declined. Now, U.S. Bank Corp is one of the biggest regional banks in the United States. And Warren Buffett is offloading it after a 50% correction. What does that tell you about the health? of the regional banking sector? And what does it more tell you about how the Fed is going to turn a blind eye to the destruction going on in the regional banking sector in order to tighten inflation? Markets think that the Fed is not going to keep rates as high as they're stating? I don't know. Fed went ahead and increased by another 25 basis points when back in the earlier portion of last month in April, no one believed that the Fed was going to raise rates. It was about 20%. That went all the way to 90% before the FOMC meeting. We were in the camp saying they were going to increase by another 25 basis points because we have been of this narrative that the Fed is going to allow some things to break. Take a look here, another good chart. As we build into this point here, Charles Schwab Corporation, a massive financial conglomerate here, over $90 billion in valuation, even after the correction we've seen here of about 50% here from those all-time highs. It used to be 100, excuse me, 
$180 billion company, roughly speaking, right? Huge financial conglomerate. Now take a look at this chart here. I want you guys to just analyze this chart. And I want you to tell me, do you see any similarities here? All right, you can scan over the price here. I'll turn off, turn off my drawings. I'll get to that in a moment. Do you see any similarities here? The big standout for me is the repeated price action of a failed breakout or lower high, similar to that of the 2000s, right? Right here in the late 1999 range, as well as 2000, and here in 2007 to 2008. And look at what we did here between February and January 2022, here towards December 2022. Within a year, a failed breakout to new highs, followed by a massive correction. Now, I don't know if this is going to be exactly like 2008 or 2000. It'll probably be somewhere in between. But that likely signals that we've got a ways to go. And I've never seen, in all my years of investing, and I think a lot of people who will tell you this, who have been trading for over a decade plus like myself, I have never, through analyzing long-term price action, found a situation where the financial sector doesn't do good, but there are some anomalies like tech that does good. Right? Maybe you could find short-term windows of time, but I'm talking about broad 30, 50% corrections in the financial sector. When financials don't do well, that is likely a time where everyone is going to lose out, where risk on activity is going to stifle. because when the financial sector is not doing good, when its projections are going lower, when its risk on sentiment starts to go risk off, that's when you start to see assets contract as a whole. And to see Charles Schwab having this kind of correction here and potentially having further downside alongside the broader regional banking sector, that is a really bad telltale sign. That's billions of dollars of market cap getting wiped out. And this is all coming at a time here, right, where we have to analyze what the Fed's balance sheet is doing, what the Federal Reserve is doing, what the federal funds rate. Because as we talked about, you know, a lot of people were focused on, okay, yeah, the 25 basis point hike, okay, fine, it's priced in, this and that. But isn't it time now to finally get bullish and you know, the market seem like we can go for the soft landing? Guys, it's all about the balance sheet. The Fed is not printing money. You know, a lot of people were of the narrative that we're gonna see a whole new wave of QE. We stuck to our guns. We looked crazy to a lot of people, but we said there's not gonna be continued balance sheet expansion. And the biggest reason why is because the Fed is not in the same environment the last decade where inflation was between one to 2% below the Fed's target. We are now well above the Fed's target and the Fed is in the driver's seat. It is trying to tame inflation. And yet again, we saw during the previous FOMC meeting that the Fed is going to be reducing its balance sheet. It is on autopilot as it has been since the beginning of this quantitative tightening program back in 2022. So sooner rather than later, we are gonna get back down to where we were back here in February if we continue on the current trajectory. But each week, we're reducing the balance sheet by an estimated $25, $30 billion when you consider some of the big drops here like we saw, all right? Now, just put that on the monthly time frame, right? We're looking at a, a nice uh, column chart here. This is really gonna help us just kind of see when liquidity is increased or decreased, right? We can see that quantitative tightening programs can go on for some time before something breaks. We had that back in January 2018 all the way to August of 2019, right? So it can be nearly two years before we see a trend reversal here from where we started back around June of 2022, All right? Now the Fed, again, when it's on a kind of normal quantitative tightening, it's usually subtracting liquidity each month by roughly around 1%. So if this keeps up for another year, that's about a 12% contraction in liquidity. I'm not saying the Fed is going to have to reduce it by that much, guys. But I got to be honest with you, we've had this drawing here for a long time. We first shared it with Dash Report members. And as we can see, right, we, we drew it back here in September, right? These kind of broad projections going into 2024, 2025, because we believe that the Fed needs to get to one of these target levels. And it's probably going to take a lot of time to do that. We think that the number one target that the Fed is likely gonna do is it's gonna contract liquidity to where we had the beginning of the second wave of liquidity injection during the pandemic. This was just kind of overkill, really unnecessary, 
this is where, again, the Fed took things to really extreme lengths. And to be honest, in hindsight, we were in lockdowns for way longer than we should have been. You know, the, the policy disaster that was during that window of time. Uh, we are going to have to, unfortunately, face the consequences of this at one point or another. And that is likely meaning the Fed is going to contract liquidity by another you know, trillion dollars plus. And that's not going to help U.S. stocks. I just want to be realistic with you guys here. I can't sell you some false narrative, uh, right? When I when I see the two-year yield staying sticky here where it's been since back in March, right? After that banking collapse we saw in Sil Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, all these players, First Republic Bank, the two-year yield still holding strong here at about 3.9% where it was back in September. U.S. 10-year yield unchanged, still holding where it was since back in December of 2022. Yield curve, starting to curve back up a little bit here, but still holding relatively low so far in negative territory. I Meaning we've got a ways to go before we're going to really get that recessionary bottom. Federal funds rate up here at 5% as we targeted well back into the summer of 2022. Back into territory we haven't seen since 2006 or 2001. And to make matters worse, oil, which should have had its breakdown the other day, got bought right back up at the 200 week. Oil is basically where it's been since back in December. There's been no major progress in cooling energy inflation when it comes to price of oil since back in December. That is not a good look when the Fed is already outpacing market expectations and continuously saying that it's going to keep increasing rates, and that's not enough to do the job. Last thing I want you guys to think about, because I want to take it back here to Bitcoin, because some of you at the end of the day, I understand this is, this is a very fair point. Some of you would be like, Nick, okay, yeah, I don't really care what happens in the stock market. I'm a crypto investor at heart. I love Bitcoin. Um, I love what Bitcoin stands for, and I think that it could be this digital hedge or that is just going to generally go up as an investment, as it has for the last decade. And I understand that a lot of people are in that camp, but if if you are in that camp still and you want to just ignore everything going on in the macro, you think that it's completely asymmetric, it's completely separate from everything, I would bring you towards the GBTC discount. The Grayscale Bitcoin discount or premiums and net assets under value for the biggest exchange trade note product that holds hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin. A huge swarm of Bitcoin is still trading at a negative discount here. Same range we were at here back in November during the time of the FTX collapse. If someone isn't willing to a brokerage account to take upon that arbitrage opportunity, even considering the 2% annualized fees that Grayscale charges, what does that tell you about the supply and demand of crypto markets as a whole? Is this rally we've seen really justified? Wouldn't we see this discount start to be eliminated? Like we were making progress on back in December and March. I'm seeing uncertainty, I'm seeing false narratives, I'm seeing a lot of marketing rather than actual sustenance, you know, an actual you know, foundation for a bull market to kick off. I'm seeing a lot of AI narrative hype, and I'm not seeing any financial reporting that's signaling that those narratives are going to hold up, at least not here in the short term. They're not going to save huge technology titans like Apple or Microsoft. And if those companies start to underperform, and they start to slow down, they're no longer valued as growth stocks. When the liquidity dries up, assets like Bitcoin that did great during the last decade, when there was a lot of liquidity injection, start to perform weaker. These are the kind of things we need to be prepared for here, guys. And if you've made it this far in the video, 
I highly recommend if you want to get access to things like our momentum indicator, which has done a great job on these longer term time frames of spotting when to get long, when to get short, right? If you're interested in that momentum indicator, if you're interested in the kind of stuff we're saying here, you guys can definitely check out the dash report down below in the description. It's one of the greatest ways you guys can support the channel and importantly, it's one of those tools that's going to allow you to see when we're making trades, what we're looking for in the market, observing opportunities, even outside of just the crypto space. And you get to join hundreds of other members in the Dash Report discussion group, getting to ask good questions, chatting alongside one another, sharing what you're finding in the market, some of the brightest minds in our community. If you like the content here, I think you're very well gonna like our community and ecosystem we have. But even if you can't join the Dash Report, guys, I ask that you please consider dropping a like. It's a great way to support the channel and get the word out there so more people see these types of videos. We need more of this, guys. We need less referral link shilling to leverage trading platforms where people end up just losing money and benefiting very few actors in the crypto space and we need more sustenance we need more quality content here and i hope that uh you know whether you agree or disagree with me all the time guys i know sometimes i'm confident in my opinions but i think you guys come here for me to present my side of the story and and what i think is is really going on in the market um you know i don't want to be you know oh i could do this could do that i want to give you guys what i really think is coming up here in the market and I'll let you know when we're roughly making those kind of actions. But if you want to get the details of it, the dashboard, it's a great way to do that. And uh, But anyways, I'm rambling on a good amount here, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video today. I hope you guys have a wonderful start to your week. Stay safe, trade smart, and I'll see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone.